Hey, good morning. It's so good to be with you all. I met so many new people, including Devon, who's here for the second time this morning. It's so good to see all of you. Thank you for all your kindness, your love, your friendliness, and thank you for organizing the sun for me this morning. You guys are just great. Thank you for coming out in these extreme weathers. I'm so thankful that this is not normal for Seattle. I can live with some extremities, but only from time to time. So last week I shared my vision with you guys for basically establishing a great church rooted in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. I um, take that overwhelming endorsement, which I'm deeply thankful for, as a mandate, that this is what we're going to do. And therefore, we're starting with a brand new sermon series simply titled, Let's Go. You said, let's do this, so let's go. On top of the 97% endorsement uh, last Sunday, I walked out of a prayer meeting in room 200 last Wednesday, and it was the best prayer meeting, the best experience with the Holy Spirit among other Christians that I had in at least the last three and a half years. I was so blessed. Thank you for everybody that came out. Please make an effort to be there next week during that prayer meeting and listening to the people praying, speaking to God around me. I just felt this is another endorsement. This is another confirmation that this is what we're going to do. Now, I know that some of you have been listening to sermons for the last 40 years and maybe more. So when I use certain words... You have certain pictures in your mind. I say the Great Commission, and you say, oh, I heard that in 1957 from pastor so-and-so, and that's what it means. So, and then your brain just clutch out. You, you, you're not going to listen anymore. And that's what I want to ask you. I, I, I'm from Africa. You know, we have different pictures. And I want to poke even those that's been listening to the Great Commission since 1947. Anybody that's... Oh, there should probably be people that old here. Yeah. So please don't just clutch out this morning. Stay with it and let's learn together about the heart of Jesus. So this will be a foundation laying sermon series simply titled Let's Go. So over the next five years, if you would, five years, five weeks, <laughs> please put up that slide. Um, we're going to delve into the essence of the Great Commission and the Great Commandments. And these are the five themes we'll be talking about every week. And you will see that they're building on top of each other. And I really want to encourage you to be here. Or if you can't, just tune in online. Speaking of online, welcome to everybody that's joining us online. Um, did you know that last week we had a record of people watching online? And uh, good things are happening and we're praising Jesus. So if you're online, thank you for being with us this morning. And as you from Africa, Africa afkom net so well, kom ek hoop jy verstaan die Engelse taal. That's a bit of Afrikaans. But before we explore the heart of God on this matter of going, proclaiming the gospel, sharing Jesus, let's just have some fun and let's see how not to do it. And I organized some of the greatest actors in Shoreline, so let's welcome them on stage. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let anyone who hears my voice open the door and I will come in and dine with him. Revelations 3.20. First of all, this is a doctor's office, not a restaurant. And second, Mr. Hyperbole, you know the door is just open. Just come on in and dine. Find your spot. Oh, Miss Bella, 
It's your turn. You can see the doctor now. I only drink from living waters. Let anyone who drinks this water I give will never thirst again. Amen. Hey. Coffee's hot, right? <laughs> yeah. Not as hot as hell is going to be. And all sinners will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Mr. Naren, doctor will see you now. Yeah, thanks. I'll see you. Yeah. Hey, I look forward now to my colonoscopy. Thank you. <laughs> colonoscopy. Hey, reading rubbish, eh? I read from the good word, the good book, King James Version only. First Timothy 3.14, devote yourself to the public reading of the scriptures. Mr. Hyperbole, please! Shh. Mr. Bartlett, the doctor will see you now. Ye who look at me with wicked eyes, are ye born again? <sighs> Mr. Hyperbole. Uh, next patient, please. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, and one goes missing, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go looking for the one who is missing? And when he finds him, he places it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, I Mr. Hyperbole, enough! The doctor will see you now. Go! Thank the team, please. Thank you so much, you guys. I'm sorry, but I don't know where we got it that following Jesus, and especially sharing him with our friends and neighbors have to be silly, weird, obnoxious. If we simply understand that Jesus walked among us like anybody else in this room. He had to go to the stores, he had to go, go to his neighbors, he had to do whatever we had to do without being weird and strange and outlandish. He was just another godly but human walking the earth. So, last conversations are really, really important. I remember my grandfather, Opa Gert. Um, he was an evangelist. He led thousands of people to Jesus all across South Africa. And he was in the pulpit until the age of 80. And then uh, he retired by going to a brand new church in another town. And there he led the pastor to Jesus and then the pastor's wife. <laughs> and by the time that we realized he's fixing to meet Jesus, the whole family was around his bed. And he had his last words and he encouraged us to keep on serving Jesus. I will never forget that moment. The last words spoken. When my son Dion was getting ready to come study in the US, he came to visit me in Germany um, towards the end of last year. And I realized that this is probably one of the last opportunities I have to, you know, have these conversations preparing my son for his adult life out there in the wild west in the USA. That was before I knew God was going to send me here. 
And um, it was weighty, it was hefty, it was important words. We had the most wonderful times I could ever pray for and ask God for. And then I remember I, I took him to the Frankfurt airport and we spent our last moments together realizing that it's never going to be the same ever again. He's going to move out of our home and so forth. And then he leaned over and he hugged me and he whispered some words in my ear. And it's words that I will treasure forever. You know, the best words that any dad ever can ask for. He said, Dad, you're a cool dad. <laughs> but then he continued with, I'm so proud to be called your son. And I treasure that in my heart forever. In Matthew 28, we again have such a last conversation setting. When we go to Matthew 28, you will realize that it's those important words that Jesus spoke because it's the end of, of an era. And I think I understand something of what Jesus went through after 23 years leading a church in, in Rustenburg, South Africa, pouring my life into and developing the leaders. It was time to say goodbye. And for the last time, we gathered around a granite table where many great things have happened, prayed through the Holy Spirit, gave us instructions, we celebrated. And for a last time, we gathered around that granite table, and I shared my last thoughts, my last words with them. And there were tears of joy and tears of sadness, but notes were taken because it was last words. It's important, these last conversations. So going back to Matthew 28, where we find the Great Commission, it's such a setting. The disciples are there. Jesus realized that this is it. Never again in this setting will it ever happen again. And that's when he came with, go and make disciples of all the nations. There you have it on the screen. So comparing the data in Luke 24, if you're writing something down, Luke 24, and also go to Acts chapter 1, and then incorporating this scripture in Matthew 28, you will see that all of this took place in, on the Mount of Olives in Bethany, which is just across from Jerusalem. This was not spoken in Jerusalem, but just opposite, outside. Every time I, Mike on, I don't know, one of these evenings, he took me to Seattle West. And my golly, what a beautiful view. And every time I see a city, I think of what Jesus said that he went outside of the city and he wept out of love the plans that he had for that city and he did not realize. So Jesus went outside of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives and the timeline for these events is within a short period around the time of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So keep that in mind. After his resurrection, before his ascension. And the instruction to wait in Jerusalem is mentioned in Acts 1, verse 4 to 5. That's where we incorporate Acts chapter 1. And the Great Commission is recorded then in Matthew 28. So both events occurred in a very short period of time within days following Jesus' resurrection. The exact timeline we don't know. But it was spoken like simultaneously. Go and wait until the Holy Spirit, and then go and make disciples in all of the nations. So the final instructions he gave the disciples are taking place right here. It's important words. It's the last words. You keep them for the very last, and then you, you count your words. And he said, go and make disciples. So part of the instruction was, firstly, to stay back in Jerusalem, on the opposite side, go and stay there until the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that's why prayer meetings are so important. That's where we gather and wait on God for the next instruction. Be filled with the Holy Spirit together as a team. But then the second thing is they would be his witnesses. Take note, in Jerusalem as well as in all of Judea and Samaria and to the other parts ends of the world. Acts 1 verse 8. 
And when I read this, the way that I read it, in my mind is a mandate to this congregation, to all of us as simply followers of Jesus. We are to be his witnesses, his ambassadors in Shoreline, but also in the greater Seattle area, of course in the state of Washington, and then in some countries wherever God would lead us to. It's meant for us as well. But do you realize it's happening outside of the walls of this church? It's in Shoreline. This is not Shoreline. It's part of Shoreline. So that's how I read it, and I hope you understand that's your mandate as well. Shoreline, Seattle, Washington, and further. Another thing that we should take note of is that this final commission of our Lord begins with the words, all authority. Very interesting. Can you give me the next slide, please? It says, oh, I think we missed something somewhere. It's, it says something, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. And then we get to that verse where it starts with, therefore so don't even try to go to therefore before we understand that all authority has been given to him so my friend Johannes Blau says in this way the whole world visible and invisible heaven and earth in other words has been wrested from the grip of any other powers whatsoever it's been given to the Lord this time, for the first time ever, he's called Lord of all. Never before, until this moment. Now look at this. When Jesus gave this commandment to his disciples, he delegated his authority to them for the very first time. The same authority that was given him is now delegating to them, which means to us. Do you realize, do you understand the weight of this? Christian, the same power that belongs to Jesus is now available to you. No wonder the command to go and make disciples is so important and why we first need to go and wait for the Holy Spirit because we need that power. His authority is now our authority. We have the means, the gifts, the graces, the authority. So, Let's go. It's as simple as that with the Holy Spirit. So what did the disciples need before they had attempted to go? The Holy Spirit. Now I want to make it very clear. And that's why I enjoyed Wednesday night so much. We can work and work and work our, if it's okay to say this from a pulpit, our butts off. And not achieve much if we are doing the work. The better way to do it is work with the Holy Spirit. Because where he goes, he's more than a conqueror already. And I'm just following in his footsteps. We need his authority. We need his power. I said it, I think, last Sunday or wherever, maybe last Saturday. When, he work, when we work, it's us working. But when he works, it's him working. And we want to work with him. They need it as we need the Holy Spirit's impartation. So according to Acts chapter 1 verse 8, their waiting in Jerusalem was critical as it is for us. It, the Holy Spirit was to be the all-pervading power behind the whole missionary operation that they're going to attempt. I am with you always. I am with you always is what he said. Again, my dear friend Blau points that, that out and he says, The presence of Christ is the great gift to the disciples. Christ in them was the key. Christ in them was the gift. And so it is also for us. The Holy Spirit is the energizer, the inspirer of sharing Jesus, of revitalization and of growth. May we be a church. May we be followers of Jesus. May we be a group of Christian friends, always inviting and waiting on the Holy Spirit. We're going to waste a lot of money and energy if we do it just because we're so nice 
because this is the program of Aurora Community Church. We need the Holy Spirit. Anybody can say amen to that? Ah, I'm in good company here. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I really do believe that mission and obedience to the Great Commission have always been through the Holy Spirit, and let's continue in that way. You ever wondered another thing? You ever wondered why Jesus wanted them? He was speaking to them on, from, from this side of Jerusalem. Why did he want them to go back to Jerusalem? Ever wondered about that? You've been serving Jesus for 40 years. Why back to Jerusalem? I have some ideas of my own. It could be because this is where he was executed. And this is where, you know, they abandoned him. And he wanted them to go back and redo it. This time in the right way. It could be that Jesus wanted them to go stand there where, where they made a mistake where they faulted him to demonstrate that they were no longer afraid of their enemies, no longer afraid of persecution, of what people would say, and this time get it right. It may be that Jesus wanted to have his followers witness to the Jews in the heart of Judaism. In other words, in a country, in a culture that's against what we are, go back there and stand in the gap Right, we are not welcomed. Probably, for me, this is what it could be. Whatever the reason, the main point for our purposes is that they begin with their testimony within Israel, within Judaism. And the mission was, first of all, to the Jews. Now, this is important for where we're going now. The commission for them is to begin with the nation of Israel, but that's not where it was to end, remember? Jesus said that, and stay with me, the command is to make disciples in all the nations, starting in Jerusalem and further out. So do the disciples obey the Great Commission? Of course. How? What was the catalyst that got them started? Anybody, any idea? Persecution. Unexpected. It was persecution that was the catalyst that got them started, that moved them, that sort of drove them out of Jerusalem. Specifically, the persecution carried out by one individual called Saul of Tarsus, a zealous Pharisee, a man who hated Christians and hated Jesus. Why? Because in his zealousness, uh, he believed in his eyes Jesus was an accursed criminal whom God judged by hanging him on a tree. And then the next several chapters that we read in Acts show a rapid succession how the gospel spread outside of Judaism because of this persecution. Immediately after the stoning, stay with me, we, we're running through the New Testament now. Immediately after the stoning of Stephen, Saul, also known now as Paul, goes on a witch hunt for Christians, and he ends up looking for them in Syria. In Syria! You know where that is? <laughs> it's outside of Jerusalem. It's outside of Israel by now in Acts chapter 9. Just one chapter before in Acts 8, Peter goes to Samaria to check on the responses of the half-Jews to the gospel that Philip had brought to them. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter is sent to Caesarea Maritima, a largely Gentile city on the coast of Palestine in the northern area of Samaria. So he is sent. Even just go there, he was sent there to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And when they have the exact same experience of the Holy Spirit being poured out, Peter knew that this is what needs to happen. Outside of our comfortable culture, outside of even what we've been taught all of our lives, we need to go in another culture where the Gentiles are. Peter was convinced that the gospel was also meant for people outside of my comfort zone. Now, this, of course, meant hmm, a great deal of cultural breaches that had to be crossed here. Stuff like that they did not need to be circumcised or have all the kind of meals that was necessary for the Jews. 
They didn't need that anymore to be saved. It's suddenly a whole new world for this group of Jewish Christians. But it was persecution that forced them, forced their eyes to be open to realize this. Because the heart of Jesus is not just for me and my household, for me and my culture, for the whole world, every tongue, nation across the planet. Now here's my main point for the day. Don't miss it. <laughs> Seen in the light of history, looking back at where we come from in Acts chapter 1 and 2, the Great Commission altered the manner and contents of sharing our faith forever. No matter how we've been brought up, we have to go back and see in the original text what was expected of those Christians. And we have to adapt wherever we are, which country we live in all over this planet. For the most part, Old Testament um, evangelism focused on pagans coming into the Jewish religion having to conform to whatever the Jews needed to do. You were baptized into Judaism. And now for the very, very first time ever, it's not about my culture. It's not about being a Jew anymore. Which means you had to let go of all your cultural holy cows for the first time. They had to follow dietary laws, get circumcised, circumcised, offer sacrifices that mark the Jews as a special people, and suddenly, no more. It's not necessary. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been for these guys? Suddenly, the missionaries were challenged into an unfamiliar world. They've never been here. They don't understand all of this. Remember the vision that Peter had about eating unclean animals? God had to give it to him in a dream so that he could understand. Because it was not part of any experiences he ever had. God had to give it to him. You know when you're dreaming, <laughs> you start sweating. It's real when you dream. That's how God had to explain his heart even to him. So just imagine what it would be like to be a disciple who for the very first time in your life could eat a ham sandwich. Huh? I wonder, I wish I could just be a fly. Never ever were you allowed to have pork and suddenly, no, it's okay. Because I need to get into this culture where they eat ham sandwiches. Now, on the one side, maybe it came up just as fast as it went down. But if you ask me, I think he exclaimed with great joy, Oh my golly, what have I missed all of my life? <laughs> this is good, man. So, obedience to the gospel certainly made them squeal a bit. Must have. It got them way outside of their comfort zone. But Holy Spirit inside of us will drive us. There's other chapters that says the, whole, the, the, the love of the Spirit drives us to do different things than what we're used to, out of our comfort zones. So remember, in Jewish circles, they are used to teach young children to be brave and obedient to the laws, even though they are made fun of. And suddenly, within the new culture, the new way of understanding God's heart for the whole world outside of just Judaism, in Galatians 2, verse 11 to 14, we read that in the old um, times, it, it was bad if you broke the mosaic fetters eating defiled food. But suddenly, in Galatians, you read that it was brave and bold of you to break the law. To go and do what all the, the, these Gentiles were eating and doing. I cannot stress this enough. How difficult this change in perspective must have been for them. But they did it. They obeyed. They took the step and they went. Because that's the heart of Jesus. For the sake of the gospel, they moved outside of their comfort zones. They did. Into all the nations. So back to Seattle. Here we are. What barriers do we have to take the gospel, to share Jesus, 
to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this city. Forget Seattle. Let's come back to shoreline. There where you stay. What's the barriers that's keeping you back? Because at some stage, Holy Spirit will tell you, enough. Give the step. Now go. That is hard. What barriers do you have to overcome in order to be obedient to the commission of Christ? I want to close, and this is actually the sermon, but we'll do it another day. <laughs> Answering the question, so how did Jesus do it? We're here in the shoreline area. We're in a postmodern, oftentimes post-Christian, sometimes pre-Christian area. What can we learn from Jesus? How did he do it? Number one, well, I see that he did good to everyone. Not only the scripture saying so, but every example that we read, he did it. Different things. The blind, the deaf, the hungry, the lonely, the outcast, even the dead. He did good to everyone. We can do that, can't we? We can be those kind of followers of Jesus, doing good to everybody, everywhere, always. That's doable. The second thing I see that Jesus did was he was intentional in loving people, going to people. Um, he made friends with people because how else will you gain influence in their lives? Uh, Mr. Hyperbole up here was really just obnoxious. He was rude. How dare you just start speaking to me about something that I'm not familiar with and not even in love? You make friends so that you have influence with somebody else. He went in the middle of the day when it's so hot that everybody was resting. He went to a well because he knew, because he was God, that there's going to be a lady that was so outcasted by the whole community because, you know, she had seven husbands and she was not married to either any one of them. On purpose, intentionally went there to ask her when there was nobody around for some water. And he engaged in a conversation with her. And that's where Mr. Hyperbole got his words from. I can give you living water that you will never thirst again. After he made friends with her. She asked him, how are you speaking to me even? You're not allowed to. And he expressed just his heart. He won her friendship. He won her heart so that he could say some very spiritual words to her. He was intentional. The third thing I see he did was, <laughs> uh, some people might differ with me, but I don't see Jesus judging anybody. Do we realize that if you're a Christian for 40 years, Jesus transformed your life into something that's totally different from somebody that never have been following Jesus before. There's obviously a difference. You can't expect the same quote-unquote standards from them. So Jesus did not judge anybody. All the church folk came to stone a lady that was found in adultery. He just looked at the ground and wrote some stuff there. And when everybody left, he said, I don't judge you, but I have a better way of living. In my mind, he was sharing John 10 verse 10 with her. I have come that you have life in all of its fullness. That's Jesus. And the last thing, there's more, but just for today, the way that I saw Jesus did something what we could also do in Seattle is, did you realize, did you see how oftentimes Jesus went and he sat down next to people. He sat next to the prostitutes. He sat down next to the drunkards. He sat with the fishermen. He sat with women, which is totally outside of the comfort zone of the Jewish culture. How do you make friends? How do you get to know people? You sit down and you have a conversation. So these four things that I'm asking you, can we do this in Shoreline? Can we do this in Seattle? He did good. He was intentional. He did not judge. 
And he sat down with people. And out of this comes the deeper spiritual conversations that we should have. In Germany, I had to often tell the guys, we cannot just give food. Uh, the, 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 the founder of the Salvation Army said people need soap and soup and salvation. <laughs> so let's give them soup and soap, but somewhere in our conversation, making friends, helping them to have the John 10 verse 10 life, we should have the conversation about Jesus. Jesus modeled that to people. He believed, and I said it last week, he modeled it that people can belong to our circle before they have to believe or even behave as Christians do. We should be the same. So in closing, the heart of Jesus corresponds with the method of how he lived. Everyone's lives mattered to him. Do you realize that everyone around you is carrying some sort of a burden? Everybody's got pain. Everybody's got something that they wish could change in their lives. Not just inside, but also outside of this building. Um, the human experience is pain, heartache. That's why prayer is so beautiful, that we can really take all of our things to Jesus, and he really cares for us. So, Aurora Community Church, could we be a church whose methods corresponds with the heart of Jesus? And I don't mean just we say yes, but that we really go do it. Those four things, that we really go do it, do good, intentionally reach out to those not yet part of our community. That we do not judge people, whoever they are, whatever they look like, wherever they come from. If they a human being, Jesus died for them because he loves them. That we go sit down with people on the bus, in Starbucks, at your workplace, maybe just outside in this foyer. Sit down with people. Take time with people. Listen to their story. And eventually also have the wonderful opportunity driven by the Holy Spirit to share your story with him. I, I, I read something I just want to share with you. Do you realize, <laughs> do you realize that there's more buzz about Jesus currently in your country than in many years before? Why? Well, I read something that says there's no doubt that you guys have seen the ad from He Gets Us. You're right. You watch the big games and the He Gets Us campaign have caused people to talk about Jesus more than in a long time in our country. And whether you like it or not, I don't care. Fact is, people are talking about Jesus because of this. Uh, the stats is that there were more people on Google searching Jesus during the 23 Super Bowl than, than during Christmas time. Did you know that? More people because of that ad we're Googling Jesus than during Christmas time. So, then there's the movie, The Jesus Revolution. I watched it on the plane, and I was in tears, telling everybody to watch it. Well, it's on Netflix, so more and more people are watching it, and that creates an opportunity for us to talk about this Jesus. It's a beautiful movie. Then we have The Chosen, do you realize that 500 million people have watched it so far? That creates a buzz about Jesus. Um, and then what's more is add in the intense media buzz around the Asbury revival last year. People in South Africa and in Swaziland and everywhere were watching and asking, is this, is this? Fact of the matter is there's an interest in the Jesus phenomena. Are we available are we ready to go sit down, stop our busy programs and be led by the Spirit to touch somebody's life? Just answering their questions. Just be there like Jesus were. This gives us an incredible opportunity to talk about Jesus. So there's a banner when you go out that door, right 
there that says, help us that heaven break into the lives of shoreline. I can't remember exactly. Can that banner become real life for us again? Let's make that happen. Let's help Jesus' love, heaven, break into shoreline again. So I want to close with every week I'm going to challenge you to do something. And this week your homework will be because we, we need to turn the lesson into a life way of living, a lifestyle. So I call it lesson to life. I want to ask you, would you share Jesus in some form, shape, however you need, however Holy Spirit opens up the opportunity just to share Jesus with three random people this week. Now remember, it's more than just saying hi. Uh, everywhere the disciples of Jesus went, they realized that they were part of the Jesus movement. So however we do it, people need to realize I'm doing this because I am loving Jesus and therefore I love you. Just three people. Can I challenge you to do it before Wednesday? Because if you postpone, it's, gonna not, it's not going to happen. So next slide, please. I want to ask you, we, we, we really want to just create a momentum with this thing. So by Thursday, that's why I want you to do it before Wednesday, would you just send a one-line or a three-line email to info at Aurora Community, just sharing your experience, whether it was horrible, bad, somebody slapped you in the face, or whatever, just share your experience that I have a feel when I come here next week. What's happening? How's it going? Are we doing, are we living, or is it just a lesson somebody preached last Sunday? Four things. We can do that. So, let's go, church. Let's go do this. Amen. Amen. So, Father, I pray for each one of my brothers and my sisters. And for me, I'm brand new. But would you create an opportunity somewhere in the next week for me, Davi, the German South African follower of Jesus is most important, to share Jesus, to share you, your love, in our community. That's my mandate. That's why I exist. I want to be obedient. Thank you, Holy Spirit, you're empowering me. And everybody in this room, in Jesus' name, amen.